One Bat Track by Drew Daniel The sun had risen over the rippling waters of Bass Strait to send newborn clouds racing across the sky like fresh-shorn lambs to tip the wavelets with sparkling silver as they broke softly on the white beaches of Wilson's Promontory. Long fingers of light reached down through the sobbing rainforest of beech, myrtle and sassafras to warm little furry bodies and draw sleep from the drowsy eyes of wallaby, emu and sleepy lizard, to blind the eyes of the night hunters, spiny echidnas and silky coated bandicoots who slunk away to hidden lairs to dream the day away. Soon the forest was a ring with the music of morning, the tinkle of the bellbird, the tink-tonk of the green honey-eater, the mating song of Minura, the magnificent lyrebird. The air was limpid and sweetly scented, alive with the shimmering enchantment born of a new day. Yet, as the mists of morning lifted, a shaft of sunlight caught the white walls of a farmhouse where a little girl lay listless, perhaps dying. As the doctor bent over Amanda, he noticed the pale lips move. "'She's trying to speak to you, doctor,' whispered Amanda's mother, her hands clasped anxiously together. "'Did you have something to tell me, Amanda?' asked the doctor gently. "'Well, just let me look into your eyes with this little light first. "'Ah, that's my girl. Good. "'Now, what is my favourite patient to tell me?' "'Amanda looked up at him, her sad little eyes filling with tears. "'Doctor, it's, it's about Wombat. "'Will you, will you go and see if you can find him? "'Try to make him live. "'If you can't, then please ask my daddy to, to bury him under the apple tree where I can put wild flowers over him. Amanda's mother moved towards the door, tears streaming from her eyes. The doctor smoothed the soft curls from Amanda's forehead. I'll see if I can find that wombat, and although I'm no veterinary, I promise you, Amanda, if it's possible, I'll make wombat well. But first, you must make me a promise, young lady, to keep very quiet and take your medicine. Is it a promise? Yes, I promise, doctor. The doctor followed Amanda's mother to the door. She turned to him with anxious eyes. How is she, doctor? She's a sick child, but I can't put my finger on the exact trouble. She has concussion, a broken arm, and shock, admittedly. But there's something more. Just what does that mean, Doctor? It's difficult to say. Amanda's lost all her fighting spirit, her smile. Anyhow, I'll see her tomorrow. Oh, by the way, what's all this about a wombat? Oh, that's the whole story, Doctor. The cause of Amanda's terrible fall. Wombat had become quite tame. He and Amanda played together. She used to feed him with turnips from the garden. I've never heard of a wombat being a pet. Oh, it's not usual, but with our little girl, well, she seemed to have some magic about her that makes the wildlife of the forest treat her as one of their own. Shy possums and wallabies remain undisturbed as she walks along what she calls wombat track through the forest. The doctor nodded his head. Most remarkable, but then Amanda's a remarkable child, loves everyone and everything. But tell me about wombat. Yes, well, with the lack of rain, Ted's been having trouble with Wombat's raiding the vegetable patch. Then, this morning, Amanda called Wombat to feed him his turnips. They played together, and then Amanda climbed the apple tree to watch him eat his breakfast. Her father came round the corner, saw the Wombat eating the turnips near the fence, and, not realising it was Amanda's pet, he fired and shot the poor thing. Hmm, murmured the doctor. Right under Amanda's eyes, eh? Yes, and in her anxiety to reach the animal, the poor darling fell out of the tree. I rushed to her and she just didn't move. It was terrible. And where's the wombat now? Oh, Ted saw it dragging itself into the forest. He phoned you, Doctor, and then he went after it. Ted thought if he could find the poor animal, he'd be able to destroy it and save it from suffering. That's where Ted is now, out looking for wombat. The doctor stroked his chin. Then that's causing a lot of your girlie's trouble. She's fretting for the old wombat. Pity I couldn't have seen it. Might have been able to help. 
but Amanda's mother didn't hear the doctor's last words. Look, she cried, there's Ted coming now, a long wombat track, and, and it looks as if he's carrying the dead wombat. That's Ted, all right. I'll go and give him a hand. The sedative had closed Amanda's eyes to consciousness, but her little heart beat wildly for her beloved wombat. And in her dream, her child spirit once again walked the wombat track into the forest, calling to him. Wombat! Wombat! Come! Come, wombat! It's turnip time! But it seemed that only her pathetic little voice echoed back through the valley until she buried her face in her hands and knelt on a heap of dry leaves to cry. But she jumped up quickly when she heard an angry, stifled little voice. Ouch! Look out what you're about! You've gone and knelt right on my snout! Oh dear, Echidna! exclaimed Amanda. I didn't know you were there. Did I hurt you? Oh, not so much. I think I'll give myself another week to live. I'm so glad, smiled Amanda. I wouldn't hurt you for the world. Well, let's forget about it then, and we'll all be happy friends again. Oh, thank you, Echidna. I do want to be friends, because I want you to help me find Wombat. Find old Wombat? Lost, is he? I wonder where that pest could be. But you don't understand, Echidna. And Amanda told him about Wombat being shot and disappearing into the forest. Echidna listened and then said sympathetically, Let's search every inch of ground until old Wombat has been found. Amanda dreamt that she dried her tears and followed Echidna until they came to the mound nest of Mally Hen and asked if she had seen Wombat. But Mother Mally Hen clucked, Oh, must you startle me this way when an egg I'm trying to lay? No wobbling Wombat did I see. Now be off and let me be. Echidna sniffed and said, Here's a possum doopy eyed, perhaps your Wombat he has spied. But Possum blinked and answered, Please excuse me if I yawn. I've been sleeping all the morn. No stray wombat could I see, unless he were to waken me. <sighs> so Echidna sniffed again, saying, That emu with her neck up bent must have seen where wombat went. Just at that moment, emu caught a horse stinger in her throat and gasped, See what you've done, you spiny goat. That horse stinger's sticking in my throat. You and your wombat, get out quick before you get an emu's kick. It's no good, cried Amanda in despair. Wombat has just crept into his burrow and died. But Echidna cheered her. Say, let's ask the lyrebird. Surely something he has heard. And they walked deeper into the fern-strewn forest to where the magnificent Minura danced his wondrous dance. Knowing how shy the Minura is, they approached quietly and asked him about Wombat, and he told them, Ask the one who comes by night and turns the sleeping forest white. He knows every single thing, Jack Frost, the magic forest king. So Amanda and Echidna walked into the valley of night until, Touched by the icy fingers of the forest king, it glistened with a thousand eyes. Echidna stopped and whispered, See that spider, the giant one? Look, a magic web he spun, and in that glittering net is tossed the magic forest king, Jack Frost. Amanda stood in wonderment as the magic forest king took her hand, but the hand didn't feel in the least cold, and the voice was strangely warm and familiar whispering the magic words, Amanda, Amanda, wake up, you sleepyhead. Your wombat's going to be all right. At once, the magic figure of Jack Frost turned back into Amanda's daddy as she opened her eyes and she heard him say, Darling, I found wombat in the forest. I carried him home and the doctor took the bullet out of his leg and he's as right as rain. Can you hear me, Amanda? Wombat's all right. Oh, Daddy, dear, dear Wombat, tell him I'll be better soon, and say, say I'll meet him down on Wombat Track. Hoot Toot Bandicoot by Drew Daniel Bandy Bandicoot lived in Tasmania, where lots of bandicoots live. 
His snug burrow was underneath the apple tree that grew beside the blue Huon River that flows down to Dover, the pretty little town right on the very bottom tip of Tasmania. In the winter, the winds blow right up from the South Pole and make Dover a very cold place indeed. But who cares about the cold when they've got a cosy, silky fur coat to keep them warm? At least, that's what Bandy Bandicoot thought. In springtime, his lovely apple tree covered herself with pink and white blossom. In the autumn, her boughs bent low to the mossy ground with bright rosy apples. Away in the distance, Bandy Bandicoot could see snow glistening on the mountain peaks, and all around were green apple trees reflected in the blue water, and pretty houses with snow-white walls and apple-red roofs. Most important of all to Bandy Bandicoot were the myriads of fat, juicy insects that lived by the Blue River. He didn't have to do much hunting. Now Bandy Bandicoot was really a Bandy Bandicoot. You see, he once got caught in a rat trap. Oh dear me, yes! Just as he was nosing around for a fat grub or two for lunch, bang, a snap went the trap. Ouch, ouch, ouch! Shaky, shivering snakes and lizards! Help, help! Get me out of it, quick! he cried. But nobody heard him, only his lovely apple tree. But she couldn't move to help him, and so she had to stay there watching her reflection in the river. It was lucky that Bandy was about as big as a rabbit, and much stronger than a rat. So, after whirling round like a mad windmill, lashing with his long tail, and pushing with his long snout, he was free. Thanks be! Shivering snakes and lizards, what an escape! he gasped. Ever after that, his two front legs were bent like boomerangs, so they called him Bandy Bandicoot. The other Bandicoots laughed and called out, Mad old Bandy, cookie old cranky, can't run for fun. But Bandy didn't care. Having two bent legs had taught him to wait until motor cars passed by on the road to Dover, while other silly bandicoots, very, very sad to say, scampered across without looking both ways and got run over. Bandy tried to make them look both ways, but they only laughed and called out, Mad old Bandy, crooked old cranky, can't run for fun. The result was that every morning Bandy would find so many of them flat as flat pancakes dead as anything on the road to Dover. He would shed a bandicoot's tear and then go off and hunt up a beetle for breakfast, then take a nap and waken with the song of birds in his apple tree, or perhaps a ripe apple would fall right onto his snout. The birds taught him to sing, and it was the funniest sound that he made, like this. Da -da -da -da, da -da -da, dee -dee 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 -dee. Then he would grow sad, thinking about the silly bandicoots who got themselves run over on the road to Dover. Then he would sing again. Very pretty! Oh, very pretty! called the cricket from the thicket. As good as I could do myself! Bandy nearly jumped out of his fur coat. Shivering snakes and lizards, who said that? I! called the cricket from the thicket. Well, you scared me. Where are you, Cricket? Ha ha! I'm not telling you, said the wise Cricket. You might eat me. No, I wouldn't. I dislike Crickets to eat. Their legs get up my nose when I catch them. But you might just open your mouth and swallow me whole, cried the Cricket from the thicket. No thanks, laughed Bandy. You'd only start burrowing in my tummy. Just the same. I'd feel safer if you didn't find me. Just let's go on talking. About what? asked Bandy. What do you wish? said the cricket from the thicket. So Bandy Bandicoot told the sad story about the bandicoots who would not look both ways, and so got run over on the road to Dover. Why, only this morning, sighed Bandy, I found a couple of my aunts and three nephews, on my mother's side that is, flat as furry flounders, dead as dodos on the road to Dover. Well, stump my wicket! What a sight! What a shock! What a thing! It's wicked, wicked, wicked! cried the cricket from the thicket. Can't you stop them, Bandicoot? No, they take no notice. Laugh because I'm Bandy. Shocking, shocking bad manners, I'd say, and you with such a beautiful voice, Bandicoot. Ah, oh, they do like my singing, admitted Bandy. They sit around each night and listen. Now let me see, said the cricket from the thicket. 
I've an idea. Why not sing a safety song instead of just la 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 la? Wonderful idea, cried Bandy. If you will help me with the words, I'll get the music from the birds. What a happy thing if we could teach the other bandicoots to sing. And Bandy thought he'd never met a cricket so clever. All that day, Bandy, the cricket from the thicket, and the birds in the apple tree put words and notes together with a motor car hoot and toot here and there. Every night now, the bandicoots gather round the apple tree to hear the bandicoot's safety song. They never ever laugh at Bandy Bandicoot. They always look both ways before going over the road to Dover, and they're quite surprised to find that they live much longer. And it's all thanks to Bandy Bandicoot, the birds in the apple tree by the Blue Huon River, and Bandy's friend, the cricket from the thicket. Now, here's how the song would sound to you if you had ears small enough to hear a Bandicoot sing. Hoot toot, Bandicoot, on the road to Dover. Hoot toot, Bandicoot, nearly got run over. Hoot toot, Bandicoot, on the road he strays. Hoot toot, Bandicoot, better look both ways. Ding Ding the Dingo Pup by Drew Daniel Ding Ding was a dingo pup, but although Ding Ding was a baby wild dog, he was as pretty and playful as any tame puppy could be. Imagine Ding Ding playing around outside his bushland kennel in the hollow log. You would want to cuddle him, carry him home to a juicy mutton bone and a saucer of milk and a comfy cushion on the laundry floor. You would want to give him a home where he could have fun chasing the chooks following you to school, and, when nobody was looking, giving a good wigging to Grandfather's slippers. Now Ding Ding would not have liked that at all. Oh no, Ding Ding was a wild dog who loved to live in the wild country where the ghost gums grew high to the sky, where the day was alive with the laughter of kookaburras, and the night was alight with the gleaming eyes of wombat and squirrel, and haunted by the wail of the curlew and the eerie call of the boo-book owl. All day in the bushland, Ding Ding spent his time jumping into the air after brown butterflies off the milkweed, and snapping the tails off tiny blue-tongued lizards with his soft, puppy pink mouth. Once he poked his inquisitive nose into a wild daisy, where a buzzy bee was busily gathering honey. Be about your business, buzzed the buzzy bee, plunging a fierce sting into Ding Ding's nose. Ding Ding gave a loud yelp and ran to warrigal his mother, who gave him a sympathetic lick with her rough wild dog's tongue, and a lot of good advice about keeping clear of buzzy bees. Yes, you would have loved Ding Ding with all his puppy pranks. But there was someone who sat quietly on her nest of reed by the lagoon who did not like Ding Ding at all. Her name was Ducky Doo. Ducky Doo was a wild duck, not pretty at all to look at, but a real little wonder at laying eggs, and the sweetest, kindest mother to her three yellow-beaked fluffy ducklings. Ducklings three squeaked and squawked all day for food, but Ducky Doo didn't turn a feather. She just kept on stuffing delicious chewed-up worms, wriggling ants, wiggling fish, and juicy plump little grubs into their greedy little mouths. Ducky Doo loved her own babies, but she did not like Ding Ding, the dingo's baby. She knew very well whose creep creeping and sniff sniffing it was that she heard near her nest each night. Mind you, Ducky Doo was not afraid of Ding Ding, but she didn't wish to have to give him a good pecking. It might cause trouble with his father and mother, and Ducky Doo certainly didn't want that. So she set about planning a surprise for Ding Ding, one he remembers to this day every time he sees the wink of a wild daisy. Yes, indeed. Much to his disgrace, Ding Ding had been nosing around Ducky Doo's nest, and he said to his mother Warrigal, That wild duck would make a nice meal for a dingo pup. I think I'll go down and eat her up. Warrigal only licked her son's head and said, I'd be careful if I were you. You might get pecked by Ducky Doo, and I don't know one ding that's got the pluck to stand up to that wild mother duck. Ding Ding took no heed. One night, 
when his mother Warrigal and his father Wild Dog had joined their friends in the dingo pack to yelp and howl dismally in chorus, Ding Ding ventured from his hollow log kennel and stealthily crept towards the lagoon to nose out a tasty supper of wild duck. Earlier that night, Ducky Doo had looked anxiously at the dark sky and wondered why the stars in the Milky Way seemed to twinkle and say, Away, 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 away and the glittering great pointers of the Southern Cross reflected in the lagoon seemed to be pointing to light away across the lagoon for her. So Ducky Doo didn't waste a moment, but whispered to her newly hatched babies, Ducky's darling, one, two, three, follow mother, come with me. Just one word she had to say for a little duckling to obey, so off they went, away, away, away. Like a flotilla of tiny feathered ships, they sailed silently to a new nest on the other side of the lagoon, where the frogs met them with croaks of wonder, and the wild daisies peered sleepily through their half-closed petals to see who was making the ripples on the dark waters. It was most unusual to see ducks abroad at that time of night. With her ducklings safe and warm in their new nest of reed and feather down, Ducky Doo skimmed swiftly back over the starlit lagoon to her old nest, where she felt sure Ding Ding would come nosing and sniffing soon. Now when Ducky Doo first laid her eggs and hatched her ducklings three, there had been a fourth egg that just would not hatch. When she was weary from sitting on it, she said, To roll it out, I think, is best. Twill leave more room in our little nest. And so she rolled the unhatched egg out of the nest onto a patch of soft green moss. As Ducky Doo reached the place where her old nest had been, she waddled out of the water to the moss patch and rolled the unhatched egg back into the nest. Now for some wild daisies, she said, turning her bill to pluck the flowers. One pink, two white. Ah, that's right. Now a pretty twisted reed. Oh dear, I really must work with speed. And now, just a tiny dab of moss. I hope his mother won't be cross, for this really beautiful coloured egg will take young Ding Ding down a peg. Ducky Doo slid silently into the water again and skimmed across the lagoon back to her ducklings three. Sitting on her cosy nest, she shook and shook and shook with laughter about what she had done, until her ducklings cried, Mum, stop shaking, for goodness sake, you're keeping your ducklings three awake. Ducky Doo only chuckled more and replied, Oh, ducky darlings, one, two, three, if a little older you could be, I'd tell you the joke and you'd laugh with me. Ha <laughs> ha, crack. At this moment, Ding Ding looked at the dark sky that seemed to frown down on him this night when he crept stealthily towards the lagoon. The nostrils on his podgy nose quivered to scent his prey. His pink ears were pricked to catch the slightest sound. For all his brave thoughts, his puppy heart was a tremble with fear. The warning of Warrigal rang in his ears. Still, he thought, what a triumph to return to Warrigal and Wild Dog with a wild duck clutch between his jaws, and the thought made him tingle down to the tips of his puppy paws. Closer, closer to the nest he crept. Ding Ding felt a cold shiver of terror as a feather flew across his nose. Achoo! He sneezed violently, and it flung him forward so that he bumped his nose on the nest of reeds. Feeling a little dazed, he peered into the empty nest. Did he feel disappointed at finding it empty? No, he was mighty glad and decided to turn and scamper home quickly. It was only then that he admitted to himself how frightened he had been of Ducky Doo. Then, suddenly, he saw the beautiful decorated egg. Hey, what's this I see? A coloured egg and all for me! Oh! I'll carry it home for mother to see. Ho, ho. And Ding Ding pushed the unhatched egg with his nose, for he thought he'd like to smell it first. Then it happened. He bit the egg and immediately it burst with a great loud bang. And Ding Ding ran. He almost flew, for he felt that a bullet had shot him through. Later, as Ding Ding lay trembling in his hollow log bed, a little dingo's prayer, he said. 
Oh, wild dogs heaven, thanks so much for saving me from death this night. I's a wicked ding pup, but I's had a terrible, terrible fright. And oh, I know it serves me right. But, but wild dogs heaven, if you'll forgive, and one more chance to me you'll give, I promise, spit me death and cross me heart. I'll do me best to keep away from wild ducks nests. And so, Ding Ding snuggled safely up to Warrigal and fell fast asleep, just as your own tame puppy would have done with his mother. Turtle's Lagoon by Drew Daniel The day was at noon in Turtle's Lagoon, a sheltered haven surrounded by small sandbanks where waving reeds grew. Here the turtles, the smaller seabirds, and the majestic black swan whiled away their happy lives, safe from the great winds and the heavy waves of Bass Strait. All was still and calm as a mill pond. Not a quack nor a ripple disturbed the silence, for most of the creatures were having their midday nap in the warm sunlight. Old Mother Turtle had quietly laid her clutch of leathery-looking eggs in the sandy hole she had scooped out on the sandbank. There were about one hundred eggs lying side by side like small white ping-pong balls. When she was ready, she carefully scraped the sand back over the eggs and patted it down firmly with her flapper. Once Mother Turtle lays her eggs, she is free to go her way without further responsibility. The sun warms and hatches out the eggs, and the tiny turtles find their own way down to the water. Sad to say, many of them are swallowed up for breakfast by wily seagulls before they ever reach it. Mother, feeling a little hungry herself, slid down to the water and looked about for a tasty nip. There was someone else who had awakened feeling like a tasty nip too. This was Water Rat. Water Rat was a very handsome gentleman who took the greatest pride in his appearance. Well, he might, for there was not a seal between Tassie and the Antarctic who had a prettier coat than Water Rat. This he knew only too well. Each morning he sunned himself on the sand and preened his magnificent fur coat. Then he would stroll up and down, stretching out his neck so that his fine golden yellow chest might be seen and admired by all. Water Rat thought little of Mother Turtle, or of any other turtles for that matter. Turtles are slovenly things, he told himself, with soft, flabby, untidy bodies. They've no style, no pride in their appearance. Well, after all, how could they with those hideous concrete overcoats to carry round on their backs? At least they could wash the sand off their feet. And Water Rat shuddered at the thought of not having spotless feet. He looked with disgust at Mother Turtle as she slid down the bank beside him and clumsily flopped towards the water. There was really only one thing you could say that Mother Turtle and Water Rat had in common. They both simply adored crayfish. So it was that Mother Turtle finally reached the water with a nasty jerk from Water Rat, for they had both sighted what their hungry little insides craved the most, a crayfish and they both made straight for it to snap it. The great rains had come and washed the poor crayfish right down into Turtle's Lagoon where Mother Turtle and Water Rat lived. I'm weak and exhausted and I fear I'm dying, sighed the crayfish. I've been washed from net to sea, from sea to lagoon. I fear death is very near. Don't be disturbed, said Water Rat. You haven't long to wait and your troubles will be over. And he made a dart at the crayfish. But Mother Turtle set her armour plated back between Water Rat and the crayfish and grabbed at it with her mouth. It's mine. I saw it first, cried Water Rat. It belongs to the one who gets it, shouted Mother Turtle, determined to have it at all costs. And they began to tussle with each other so that the crayfish nearly got away. There you go cried Mother Turtle. You nearly made us lose the crayfish, you stupid. I'd sooner lose it than let a disgusting, dirty-looking turtle gobble it up, sneered Water Rat. Indeed, I'm sure the crayfish would rather be eaten by a soft-hearted turtle than a sharp-snouted Water Rat, wouldn't you, crayfish? she asked him. I can't say I want to be eaten at all, sighed the crayfish wearily. But if I had to be eaten, I'd prefer to be dressed with salad and mayonnaise before it happened. We crayfish have our pride, you know. 
but right now, he groaned, I think I'm going to die anyhow. And he turned up his claws and started to sink. Suddenly, Water Rat and Mother Turtle saw a great floppy beak plunge into the water. It was Pelican's beak. Why not let me be your legal adviser? suggested Pelican. I shall in justice consider the case and decide who has first claim to the crayfish. Water Rat and Mother Turtle stared at him in amazement for a while, and then Water Rat spoke. Certainly, I think that's a grand idea. Let Pelican decide. Oh, very well, Mother Turtle agreed. But I'll have you know, Pelican, that the crayfish belongs to me. That's not true, snapped Water Rat. I saw it first. It's mine. Tot, tot, said Pelican. This is no way to settle a legal matter. And now, until some decision is made, I'll take the crayfish into my possession and hold it for whichever one wins the case and is legally entitled to have it. And so saying, Pelican dived after the crayfish and stowed it inside his pouch under his bill and began to speak again. Do you not agree that this is the fairest way? He questioned them. They agreed, and Pelican began again. And now, after due consideration, I propose to halve the crayfish and divide it between you. No, shouted Water Rat. I saw it first. I shall have it all. The crayfish belongs to me, cried Mother Turtle. Besides that, I have just laid one hundred eggs, and I need it more than lazy, useless Water Rat. And she turned sharply and nipped Water Rat on the leg. He squealed and tried to scratch her with his sharp claws, but it hurt him more than it hurt her, as he only scratched her concrete-like coat and felt the pain in his claws. Are you quite sure you won't divide the crayfish? demanded Pelican, looking like the Statue of Justice standing above them with his great floppy beak. No! No! they both shouted, and the same argument started all over again. Well, the case favours neither of you, said Pelican in his best legal voice. Have either of you any witnesses? Then all the turtles and all the water rats gathered round. The turtle said Mother Turtle should have it. The water rat said Water Rat should get it. But this was only because each witness thought if the crayfish were put back into the water, it might well be snapped up by any lucky one. Even now, said Pelican, after great questioning and deliberation, we seem to be no farther ahead, so I'll divide the crayfish and be done with it. And he clapped his beak and flapped his wings, and then, pretending to be quite surprised, he said, Upon my pelican's heart and feathers, I've gone and swallowed the thing. And that seems to have settled the matter for you, doesn't it? Poor Water Rat and Mother Turtle couldn't do anything but stare at Pelican. Anyway, observed Pelican, I shall not charge you a cent for my valuable legal opinion. And he spread his great wings, lifted himself high in the air, and flew away. Off all the cheek, cried Mother Turtle. He's gone and flown away with our crayfish in his tummy. I hope it gives him indigestion, flared Water Rat. Oh, well sighed Mother Turtle. It was our own fault. We should have been prepared to share. You're right, agreed Water Rat. We should have shared, rather than make all that vulgar row. For half a crayfish isn't much, but twill be better than none at all right now. Kookaburra the Kingfisher by Drew Daniel Did you know that our Laughing Jack, or Kookaburra as we know him, is really a kingfisher? Well, perhaps you did know it, for many of the school books have stories about him. But never before has this story been told about just how our kookaburra came to be called Kingfisher. It all happened many long years ago, when Australia was a very new country to the white man. You can imagine how the early settlers were struck with wonderment to see this great big bird sitting in his gum tree, laughing his gay laugh. Of course, Kookaburra had always been known and loved by the Aborigines. He was part of their primitive life, and they were always happy to hear his merry laugh blend in the raucous harmony of their corroborees. Now it was all through Kookaburra that these lovable birds came to be called Kingfisher. Cooker had eaten his last field mouse for the day, 
tucked his head under his wing and fallen thankfully to sleep on his twig nest when suddenly there was a thump as a big lazy cuscus dropped his fat furry body from one branch to another. Then Kookaburra heard the sound of nuts being crunched and he knew Fallinger the flying squirrel was also in the tree. Kookaburra was cross for he knew both Cuscus, who looks a bit like a native bear, and Fallinger were night prowlers. He knew they'd probably keep on waking him up all through the night. Suddenly Kookaburra became aware that Cuscus and Fallinger were talking about something very important. In a second he was wide awake, listening as Cuscus said, It's all wrong. Do you know that they mean to bring the Magic Flower Queen right through bushland during the royal tour? Well, what's wrong with that? asked Fallinger the Flying Squirrel. After all, the bushland animals have a right to see their queen too. Of course they have, snapped Cuscus. But don't you see? It's the danger she'll be in. They've no right to take risks with Her Majesty. What nonsense! What could possibly happen to her? She'll be drawn in a beautiful gold carriage with horses and coachmen and a dozen different guards and equerries. I think, Cuscus, you're just imagining the danger. All right, you can talk as you please, but I think the Queen is likely to get some dreadful frights out here. Just imagine her coming face to face with one of our Australian lizards, that frightening bearded dragon, or that dreadful looking thorny devil. Imagine her waking terrified in the night to hear the howling of our dingo packs or the eerie call of the curlew or the weird hoot of the wicked boobook owl. Take my word, it would take all the equerries and all the guards all their time to explain these things away to the dear lady. Oh, you're exaggerating, cried Fallinger, crunching a nut between his jaws. The Queen must have heard all about these things and if she were going to be frightened, she wouldn't come. I may be exaggerating, warned Cuscus, but you'll admit there's a danger of snakes. Suppose she stepped on a python. Suppose she were to catch hold of a green tree snake. You know how they wind themselves around to look exactly like the stems of creepers entwined in the branches? What would her coachman be able to do about that, tell me? Oh well, said Fallinger, we'll just have to hope these things don't happen. Anyway, there's nothing we can do about it. But Cuscus insisted, there should be someone who knows all about these things to protect her. Very well, suggested Fallinger mockingly. Suppose I write to the governor and ask him to have you, Mr. Cuscus, appointed guide of the royal progress. Ha ha ha. Then Fallinger stretched his wing-like arms and glided silently to another tree, for he was tired of all this talk. All this time Kookaburra had been listening. He agreed with every word that Cuscus had said. There's only one thing for it, thought Kookaburra to himself. I must fly to Her Majesty's side and never leave her. And so the little Kookaburra left his nest on that warm summer night and flew to a stately gum tree growing by the silent blue harbour where the Queen's royal ship laid at anchor. Next morning, when dawn painted the Australian sky with pink and gold, Kookaburra perched on the tip-top branch of the gum tree and laughed his merry laugh, as if to say, Welcome to our magic flower queen. As Kookaburra laughed, he could see the sailors and the guards pop their heads out in surprise, and then an equerry appeared. And then, to the sheer delight of Kookaburra, she appeared, the exquisite young queen. Kooka quivered so that he nearly fell off the branch. Every feather was a flutter, for he could see his lovely queen smiling and waving to him, and so he laughed more joyously than ever before, as if to say, Go where you may, your majesty, I shall guide and protect you, for I know more about the Australian bushland than any guard or any equerry. On the second morning, the queen came to watch him again, and Kookaburra laughed his merry good morning to her. But then she disappeared down into the ship, and Kookaburra flew to catch himself a breakfast of field mouse. When he returned to the tree, he saw that she was about to get into her golden coach, and he swooped low to catch a closer look of her lovely face. Hey! cried a guard running with his gun. I'll put an end to that impertinent bird! But the queen raised her hand and all sprang to attention, and then the order went out that on no account was the bird to be molested. 
He gave me my first welcome to Australia, smiled the Queen, and henceforth he is to be my mascot, my royal mascot. Let no man harm him. She smiled at Kookaburra, who sat proudly on a nearby branch, and then he swooped and perched on the rail of her golden coach. And so he kept his promise never to leave her side, and the Queen and Kookaburra grew to love each other very much. He loved her for her beauty of face, her charm of manner, her grace and kindness. She loved him for his handsome appearance, his merry laughter, and his loyal devotion to her. At last came the great day when the magic flower queen was to make her royal progress through bushland. The heath, the wattle, and the wild clematis bloomed in splendid colour. The native lilac scented the air with its fragrance. Every kind of bush animal and bird had come to greet her. Even the night-wandering wombats had come with sleepy eyes to cheer with the others, and the native wildcats, friendly to no living creature, had come, having licked their fur to gleaming perfection so that it shone in the light of the sun. Of course Fallinger and Cuscus were there, and imagine how surprised everyone was to see Kookaburra proudly sitting on the rail of the golden coach. "'Well, well,' cried Cuscus, "'what do you think of that?' just what was needed, a true bushman to guard Her Majesty. I think he's got a cheek, said Fallinger. But look, the coach is stopping. Her Majesty is getting out. Oh, look, oh, look, a snake, a snake. It's near her foot, quick. And while the coachman and equerries were gathering their wits, Kookaburra darted, swift as a flash, caught the snake in his bill and carried it to the high branch of a gum tree wrestling with the killer and shaking it until it stopped wriggling and was good and dead. Then he hung it over a branch where he would find it later for a tasty meal. Then, as everybody cheered, Kookaburra returned to his rail on the coach as if nothing had happened. But the Queen came to him and stroked his feathers. I shall reward you for this act of bravery, my bird. You will know the meaning of my gratitude and you will know the fullness of my love for you. All bushland was hushed as the lovely young queen raised her magic wand and turned Kookaburra into a handsome king in a radiant blue robe. As he stood with his arms around his queen, he laughed a merry laugh, and then they entered the golden coach together and were happy ever after. Well, well, upon my breakfast, what do you think of that, Fallinger? I suppose now every kookaburra in the bush will expect to be called king after that. Why not? laughed a great grandfather kookaburra from the top of the gum tree. We are king in many ways. And tell us one way, snapped Fallinger. Take fishing, replied great grandfather kookaburra. Nobody but nobody can fish like a kookaburra. Agreed, said Cuscus. So all right. We'll call you Kingfisher. And so they did, ever after. Little Shamrock by Drew Daniel It was in a very old garden that Little Shamrock grew, neglected and almost dead, until she was discovered by someone very new. Little Shamrock had originally come from Ireland many years ago, when Mrs. Moran lifted her carefully from the rich black soil in her Dublin garden and popped her into a tiny flower pot. Mrs. Moran had said, And sure now, at least when I go to live in this new land, Australia, I'll have a little bit of Ireland with me while I have this dear little flower pot and my dear little shamrock. And so it was that the tiny plant was set in the richest soil of Mrs. Moran's Australian garden and was tended and watered and loved. Mrs. Moran loved all her flowers and her garden was the pride of Lilybale, the town where she had made her new home. All who came to admire her garden were especially escorted down the driveway where Mrs. Moran would stop and say, There now, that's me little shamrock, and what do you think of me darling plant? Brought her here all the way from home, so I did. Indeed, oft in the stilly night I imagine I see the leprechauns hovering about her, and all the little people from the fairy tales of Ireland seem to be about the dear little shamrock. Then Mrs. Moran would smile, and sometimes there was a hidden tear in her eye. Little Shamrock loved her mistress very dearly. She grew with all her might, though sometimes she felt very hot in the Australian summer. 
But when it was very hot, Mrs. Moran would give her a drink of fresh rainwater every day and pack pretty green moss around her so that she would think she was back in the Emerald Isle. Little Shamrock was grateful and would spread her leaves wide to say thank you. The years passed by and Mrs. Moran grew old. Soon she was no longer there to tend her beloved flowers. They all knew when at last she had gone, and they mourned her. Many of them hung their heads and died too, for there was nobody to water them and love them any more. In time, Mrs. Moran's nephew, Gerald, came to live at the house at Lily Vale. But Gerald cared nothing for the garden. Oh, I haven't got time for the garden, he would say. It's too much like hard work. I'll just let the old shrubs and the ivy and the periwinkle take over. They can look after themselves, won't even need watering. When little Shamrock heard this, she was very frightened, for she knew that she could never live without water. I'll just perish in the hot sun, she told herself aloud, so that the ivy heard her, and he said, Don't worry, little Shamrock, I will grow as quickly as I can so that my tendrils will shade you. I will catch all the rain I can in my broad leaves and store it for you, little shamrock," said the geranium. And I will scatter the petals from my roses around you to keep the ground moist," said the climbing rose on the fence. Oh, you are all so kind to me," whispered little shamrock. Nonsense," laughed the ivy. What would dear Mrs. Moran think of us if we let you die? Dear Mrs. Moran? sighed little shamrock wistfully how much we miss her and so with the years the garden grew old and tangled and choked with roots although they all tried to keep their promises to little shamrock she was fast dying the ivy had grown into a monster so that through no fault of his own he was gradually smothering her his great thirsty roots robbed the ground of moisture so that little shamrock and even the geraniums and the strong climbing rose couldn't get enough water to quench their thirst. Little shamrock grew thin and straggling. Her leaves, once bright emerald green, had yellowed. She knew she had but a few short weeks to live. Only a miracle could save her. But sometimes miracles do happen. One morning the shrill sound of the old postman's whistle filled the garden. <coughs> Then little Shamrock heard Gerald's voice. Good morning, Posty. Something for me, I hope. Too right, smiled the postman. It's the one you've been waiting for, I guess, sir. The letter from Ireland. Ah, oh, yes, cried Gerald. This'll tell me when she is coming, I hope. Little Shamrock watched Gerald tear open the square letter and read it, while the inquisitive postman waited to hear what it said. Good news, is it, sir, about the little one? Yes, indeed, said Gerald. She's arriving tomorrow. Oh, well, good o, said the postman. You'll have someone to keep you company now, and about time, Mr. Gerald. Yes, agreed Gerald. I'll have to start being a real live uncle now, won't I? And it was the first time little Shamrock had seen him looking happy. She wondered to herself who the little one was who would be arriving tomorrow. Early next morning, little Shamrock heard Uncle Gerald's heavy footsteps on the driveway. Within a couple of hours, he was walking back again. Little Shamrock peeped out, for she heard little footsteps on the gravel too this time. There beside Uncle Gerald was the loveliest little girl with rosebud cheeks, eyes as blue as the River Shannon, and soft brown curls that shone in the sunlight. Little Shamrock and all the others gazed with joy at the beauty of the tiny girl and Uncle Gerald's voice sounded gentler than they had ever heard it before. There you are, Kerry, he was saying proudly. This is your new home. Do you like it, darling? Oh, sure, and I think it's a darling place, Uncle Gerald. And indeed, it's loving you very much I am to come all the way from Ireland to live with you when darling father and mother died. And in an instant, she was in his arms and he carried her inside the house. The very next morning, Kerry appeared in the garden with a rake in her hand and a hoe. She wore big gardening gloves on her tiny hands. Then all the shrubs and creepers were surprised to see Uncle Gerald trailing along behind her, carrying a spade, a pair of clippers, and a great long green hose. Now I think we'll be starting right here, Uncle Gerald, 
announced Kerry, for she had told Uncle Gerald that she came from a lovely rose garden in Dublin, her home city. She said she just wouldn't be happy without a garden, and lots of flowers. So the work began. All the old untidy shrubs were torn out, and the climbing rose was pruned neatly. Now we'd better tackle this ivy, said Uncle Gerald, cutting a great slice off the ivy with his clippers. That's got it. Now for some of these weeds. Little Shamrock saw his great hand coming towards her, and her heart nearly stopped beating. Just then the climbing rose saw what was happening, and jabbed a long twisted thorn into Uncle Gerald's hand. Ouch! he cried, and Kerry ran to his aid. What happened, Uncle Gerald? Oh, it's nothing. I'm just trying to get these jolly weeds out. Kerry knelt close beside him, and then it happened. Kerry saw a little shamrock. Don't touch that one, Uncle Gerald, she cried out. It's, it's a shamrock. And Kerry's eyes filled with tears, for she could see the little shamrock was nearly dead. A shamrock, cried Uncle Gerald. Why, child, the Australian sun has affected your head already. No, no, Uncle Gerald, it is a shamrock, a real shamrock. Oh, please don't pull it out. You don't want me to pull it out, teased Uncle Gerald. Indeed, no, for sure it's going to be my own special plant. And bending down, she whispered to little shamrock, Kerry is going to look after you, my darling. I'll give you fresh rain water every day, and I'll pack soft green moss around you and care for you until you're strong and your leaves are bright emerald green once again. Little Shamrock's heart was so filled with love that she just wanted to weep. Nobody had loved her so much since dear Mrs. Moran went away. Kerry kept her word, so that little Shamrock grew lush and green and spread herself right out over the gravel path. All the plants were happy once again, and so were Uncle Gerald and Kerry happy, but, most of all, so was little Shamrock. And who do you suppose was looking down on the darling plant, and the darling girl? Yes, dear Mrs. Moran. <laughs>